Sunday. Uh, uh, traditionally, when things are open, this is the time for us to sort of be in, coming out of our summer and getting together with new energy for the programming year. Uh, we are doing the best we can to re recreate that online this year. Um, please find the bulletin this, that, uh, that came along and with the link to this service. That's helpful to follow along as it is every week. Um, good information and other uh, things to know about what's going on in our Savior. And also the, uh, the announcements. The announcements have a link to the Congregational Annual Meeting. Today we're gonna try and do our annual meeting uh, by Zoom. You need that link that's in the uh, announcement pages uh, to get hooked in. That is at 11 o'clock on Sunday, the 13th of September, this, this Sunday. The uh, focus of all of the lessons for today is on forgiveness, uh, the heart of what it means to work through our relationship with God and with one another. And so please listen carefully to the first lesson from the book of Genesis, which is the theme lesson for my sermon. So we begin with these words of confession. Trusting in the word of life given in baptism, we gather in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Most merciful God, you know our failings better than we do. Our sins are revealed in the light of your face. Our days and years pass by, and the things we trust fade like grass. Guide us again to the water of life. And renew, us up, and renew in us the grace of holy baptism. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may, be, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong that they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide, will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For, this, for, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sinned against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. 
For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 7,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seized him by the throat and said to him, Pay what you owe. Then this slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him and went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. With this Sunday, we are doing the best that we can to celebrate Life Together Sunday here at Our Savior Lutheran Church. Over the last couple of years, the Sunday after Labor, Labor Day has been set aside as a day to think about how we create and live out the life of the church, not just as individuals, but as a family, as a community, or at least as a congregation that seeks to act in unison as much as possible. This year, Unlike any other year in the 60-year his, history of the life of our Savior, we have the challenge of celebrating life together Sunday at a time when we cannot actually be together. The reality of our times are stressing community life in ways that community life was never intended to endure. In the best of time, doing things together can result in misunderstandings or hurt feelings. It can result in bad leadership, seemingly unforgivable offenses, and even ultimately, life attempts at living together can end with broken relationships and people walking away. And now in these times, these painful outcomes are that much more likely. Whatever skills were needed to pull off life together last year, and the year before that, and for the decades before that, are now needed many times over. Now, more than six months into a mandatory stay at home and stay safe mandate, that restricts group gatherings in our area, in our communities. We are being told that another unforeseen and unaccounted for pandemic of sorts is coming our way. It is the pandemic of serious mental and spiritual illness and breakdown. A headline in the Seattle Times from Wednesday, this week's Wednesday paper the headline says, we must prepare for the coming COVID-19 mental health crisis. We are the people, we and the people we love are facing many more months of rising infections and death tolls, the paper reads. A national economic and social challenges. But now together we face, and this is just a partial list, of what they write. Now together we face long dark days of fall and winter 
under social distancing and isolation. We face uncertainty about schools and child care, about crushing unemployment, and about the November elections. Domestic violence is on the rise. Depression is on the rise. Suicide is on the rise. It appears that it is much easier to figure out how to live together when we can actually live together. Last week we heard from Pastor David Hahn who talked about the need to become listeners with others who are addressing us in the ways that we, that we may have offended them and listen to that offense and work together, talk it through, to work for reconciliation, for repair, and putting the relationship back together. But this week, the lessons have a much loftier goal. It's not about reconciliation that we are after, but it is about forgiveness. It is, about, it is not about talking things out so that we can get back to being together. Now it's about finding a way of life together after the offenses have cut deep into us. Now it is about um, living through a healing that is incomplete. Talking, when talking has failed and there's nothing more we can say, getting back to life after the past has faded, but the memory of what has happened is still vivid and clear. The air is thick with questions. Is a return to a healthy life together more than just a dream? Is forgiveness even possible? Today's first lesson from, the Genesis, from Genesis chapter 50 presents some of the last words of the book of Genesis and the very last words about the life of Jacob that began in chapter 25. That means that half of the entire book of Genesis is about Jacob and his life and his family and his 12 sons. Jacob, who was born in chapter 25, Jacob was born grabbing onto the foot of his twin brother Esau and the struggle to live together began. If we know nothing about Jacob and the life of his 12 sons, the one thing we need to know at the very beginning is that when it comes to life together, when it comes to family relationships, everybody in the family has reason to be afraid of others. Everyone has reason to lash out with anger. Everyone has reason to break things off and walk away. To begin with, Jacob has two wives who are two sisters. And Jacob was deeply and openly in love with the younger sister, Rachel. But when he tries to marry Rachel, his father-in-law, Laban, the father of these two sisters, tricks him into working for a total of 14 years for him. The first seven, he has to marry Leah, the older sister, and then seven more years to finally marry Rachel, the woman he loved. Joseph is the firstborn of the wife that Jacob loved, Rachel. Joseph has 10 half-brothers who were born before him, but he has only one full brother, Benjamin, who is by his mother, Rachel, and is the baby of the family. As Joseph is growing up, Jacob extends his special love for Rachel by showing favoritism to Joseph, giving Joseph all kinds of special favors, all kinds of special gifts, to the point where the rest of the brothers become crazy jealous. And so they, they hatch a plot where they're going to do away with Joseph. They're going to kill Joseph. And while they're on an errand of taking care of the flocks out into the wilderness, they set upon Joseph and they strip him of his fancy clothing and they throw him in a pit where he will die. 
But then one of them sees a, mer a, mer a caravan of merchants heading on to Egypt. And so they say, let's make a little money off of our brother Joseph. And they pull him up out of the pit and they sell him to the merchants as a slave going to Egypt. And they, in order to, tell, to cook up a story to tell their father, they kill a goat and splash the blood on the clothes and tell Jacob that his beloved son has been killed by wild beasts. All of this, I hope you can see, is horrendous human, relation, human behavior. Anyone who would understand if Joseph had vowed from that day forward to eventually exact, exact revenge on his brothers, to eventually be able to do them in. In fact, there are entire Hollywood movies written about this kind of anger-driven revenge that is born of injustice, heroic figures who finally get their revenge. A lot happens between this day that I just described, when Joseph is sold as a slave and the day that is described in this first lesson for today. In Egypt, Joseph stumbles into being in the household of the Pharaoh, a servant in the Pharaoh's house, where he accurately predicts a great famine that is coming. And he's put in charge of a food uh, storage program that saves up food for that famine and saves the Egyptians from starvation. He is awarded a top government position and many years later under the stress of starvation, Jacob sends his 10 remaining sons, 10 of his remaining sons off to Egypt to try and find the food that they need in order to stay alive. But he keeps Benjamin, the other son of Rachel, back with him to comfort him. But Joseph hides his identity from his brothers and exacts a small amount of revenge from them by kind of jerking them around, playing all kinds of games with them. They don't know who he is when he takes one of them, Simeon, hostage, sends the rest off, but he sends them off having put money back into their uh, sacks of grain and, and a night later putting more into a sack for Benjamin. He accuses them of stealing and he threatens to enslave Benjamin because of their stealing. The family tensions remain long after the truth of Joseph's identity is revealed and they take up permanent residence in Egypt. And while Jacob is still alive, somehow he keeps the family from just sort of exploding on each other. But, but now Jacob has died. Now the serious offenses on all sides of the family could explode. And it squelches any hope of ever being a whole and healthy family. And yet, to the shock of everyone, all of the brothers make peace with one another. And Joseph finds it within himself to, to tenderly say, have no fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. How is that even possible, that he can have that much a change of heart? Throughout my, I think, more than 45 years now of ordained ministry, it seems that no topic has received more attention than the topic of forgiveness. People are always asking me to teach about forgiveness and all throughout those years of ordained ministry, no topic has gotten more difficult and more complex over the years than the topic of forgiveness. The more I live, the more I experience, the more I see what happens in the world, the less and less I have to say about the topic. The, more, the less confident I am that my words are true. But the one thing that rings true throughout all of the lessons for today is the notion that we, as beings of God's creation, are not the ones who forgive what happens to us. Joseph says, am I in the place of God? Paul says to the Romans, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. 
And Jesus reminds Peter that God's capacity for, for forgiveness is innumerably great. Nobody knows how big it is. Nobody knows how deep it is. God is the forgiver. God is the restorer. God is the one who has the power to make things as they were intended to be. God demonstrates most clearly his desire and capacity forgiveness when in the life and death and resurrection of the Christ of God, God takes into himself the world's propensity to be mean, to be evil, our, our propensity to mess things up. God in Christ speaks the power of forgiveness to everyone he meets along the way, and the blind are able to see, and the demon-possessed are set free, and the dead come back to life. That's what forgiveness does. God in Christ is nailed to a wooden cross and God in Christ is raised from death and given ultimate reign over all things. We do not need to be able to duplicate God's forgiveness on our own, on our own or even to know why or how God is capable of doing it. We are only invited to trust that it is true and to keep on living the life that God gives us to live as long as we are able. When confronted with the confession of his brothers, Joseph has a choice. Both are le legitimate choices, both choices he is entitled to have. Joseph could continue to let the years of resentment come pouring out. He has the power, he has the um, right to continue to lash out with violent acts against his brothers. But instead, Joseph has had enough. If things are going to be the way that they are going, then there's only more pain, more sadness, more grief in the future. And so Joseph chooses to let God deal with the vindication. He chooses to keep on living the life he has been given to live to finally be a brother to his brothers. To finally use the gifts he has received from God, not just to save them from starvation now, but to assure that they have life in the future. It takes great courage, great courage, with all that we now know about what's going on in our world and in our lives, to keep on living, to push back on the depression, on the lashing out, on the self-destructive uh, tendencies. It takes great courage not just to, to survive, but to keep on living. Living with innocence, even when we know that there is no such thing. Living as though the world is filled with good and loving people and cultures, even when we know it also cradles those who are evil and have bad intentions in their hearts. To go on about our business with freedom and lightness of being, even as we work to protect ourselves and our loved ones and to honor those who do the protecting for us. It takes great courage to weep with those who have caused us to shed our greatest tears and to proclaim with confidence at a time when it looks least likely to be true. Have no fear. God will provide for you and for your little ones. Amen.
with gratitude in our hearts for all that we receive from God, especially what we receive in this community of faith, our saviors. Let us pray this word of thanksgiving. God of majesty, in your might you have created all things, and you entrust to our care what you have made. Receive our offerings and make them a sign of our dedication to provide for the needs of all people and creatures. In the name of the one who sustains all things by his word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The prayers of the people. God of life and breath, you are our source of hope. We give thanks for your precious gift of life. Embrace us in your love. Sustain us when we are feeling broken or frightened. Open our hearts to hear your word and call. Strengthen us to seek justice for our neighbors. Grant us creativity to joyfully share your good news. We give thanks for your creation. Enable us to be educated to be better stewards of your world. We give thanks for our partners at Earth Ministry and Lutherans Restoring Creativity, Creation. We pray for your world, our world, nation, and local communities. We lift up people for whom insecurity and violence are the norm. Help us to bring healing and safety to all. God of mercy, guide us to awareness of our prejudices and empower us to act to eliminate racism in our church and community. Oh God, help us to behold one another as you behold us. Help us to be more firmly rooted in the practices of the gospel so that the way we live will make real your beloved community within and among us. We pray for our school teachers, college and university professors, child care leaders, staff, students, and parents as they prepare for a new academic year. Give them wisdom and creativity. Grant them patience and safety. Remind them that you are with them in the midst of it all. We pray for all in the wake of natural disasters. We are mindful of those in the wake of raging wildfires in California and powerful storms in the Gulf of Mexico. Grant safety in the midst of chaos and fear Grant strength to those affected as they recover and rebuild. We lift up all in our community who provide emergency services, medical workers, firefighters, and police. Grant them strength, endurance, and safety. We pray for all who are in need of healing and strength. We pray for those who are facing ongoing challenges and health concerns, Marlene, Carol, Nancy, Carmen, those affected by the California wildfires. Nancy, Doyle and his family, Scott, Gwyn and Don, Jeremy, Henrik and Patty, Vern, communities across the country, Mike and Dave, guests of the Community Meals Program, Sonia, Nicole, Josie and Jeannie. We continue to pray for those affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Grant peace to the families of those who have died from the coronavirus. Provide healing for those diagnosed. Protect and sustain care providers and chaplains. Guide work to improve testing and work toward a vaccine. 
Sustain those unable to work in facing financial uncertainty and help us to be wise when we go out in public to catch up with friends. We pray for our neighbors who are fearful or in danger in their relationships. We lift up the work of those who protect, support, and advocate for people who are experiencing domestic violence. We lift up those experiencing anxiety, depression, and other mental challenges. Empower us to reach out to those who need care and support. For those of you who are in despair, remember that you are loved. You are never beyond God's mercy and grace and love. We pray for those who are grieving. Lord God, wrap your arms of love and hope around all who are experiencing any kind of loss, disconnection, or brokenness. We lift up the family and friends of Jean, Dee, Marlene, Nikki, Dick, Jermaine, Bob, and Fran. We pray for your church. We give thanks for the leaders and members of, members of ministries in our congregation. Grant them creativity for their work. Give them grace and, and to rest when needed. We pray for the residents, staff, and families of nursing homes and care facilities, including those ministries that are part of our synod. Joseph, Josephine Caring and Communities, Boss Homes, Columbia Lutheran Home, Norse Home, Bethany of the Northwest, and Hearthstone Community. We pray for congregations in the call process. Grant them wisdom and patience as they discern where it is that you are leading them. We lift up transition teams, call committees, transition pastors, congregation staff, and lay leaders and synod staff. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Trusting in your mercy and grace, we lift our prayers to you. Amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We go out with God's blessing. The life-giving God, who sets us free in Christ, encourage you with the presence of the Holy Spirit, and bless you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.